Hello. I'm glad to introduce to you a man of integrity and honor and a great icon of our community. And I think it's going to be a very good thing if he is allowed to do the proper introduction of himself. But my name is Talashi Jayaba, well known as Mr. T. Please feel free and relax as we continue with the program. Hi, I'm an icon. I am Dr. Nathaniel Adejumobi Rotowa. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. My father's name is Ezekiel Rotowa Omoshulu and my mother is Madam Alice Adedewura Rotowa. My father is a native of Ikarea Koko in the now Ondo state, then Western region of Nigeria. And my mother, uh, Mrs. Adedewura Rotowa, is also from Ikarea Koko, of also of Ondo State, Nigeria. Ikarea Koko is a city in southwestern Nigeria. It is located in the southwestern High Ridge Ondo State. It is about a hundred kilometers from Akure, the Ondo State capital. I was born into a large family in Asia Street in Ikare Akoko. My father 
Ezekiel Rotowa was a very successful farmer and trader in his days. And my mother, um, Ura Rotowa, was also a trader until her last days. My father used to travel extensively and he went to as far as Bonicha in those days. That was in the in the forties and uh, in the in the in the forties actually. I was brought up by my mother and my brother. I haven't lost my father when I was very young. I used to assist my my brothers and mother in farming. We had a big big cocoa farm and my mother was a cocoa trader until her last days. My grandmother used to make sure of our breakfast in the morning before we go to school in terms of preparing akara and echo for us. I went to St. Thomas Primary School in Eche Street, Ikare, Aquinas College, Akure, and University of Ibadan, where I studied medicine uh, uh, until 1975. I was one of many children. Uh, my father had 10 of us, and uh, mainly, mainly boys, there were only two girls, and we were all successful. Um, nowadays, um, many people don't go to the farm, but I used to go to the farm, you know. Uh, Asia Street in Karakoko used to be a small place, but now it's a sprawling, sprawling big quarter in in uh, in in Kare. Um Well, um, yes, that's that's about me. Uh, that's about my family, and uh, yes, um, I'm celebrating my 70th birthday. But a lot of things have uh, really gone before um, this day. Ikare is a home to several educational institutions in, my, in Nondo State. Part of the institutions are Federal Technical College Ikare, Victory College Ikare, Citadel International College Ikare, Ikare Comprehensive High School Ikare, and so many government and private owned secondary schools and primary schools. Ikare sons and daughters are well educated and are presently holding national and international positions. Ikare has a rich cultural heritage with exciting festivals every year. The popular New Yam Festival is the chief festival in Ikare, which is celebrated every June 20th. On this day, Ikare sons and daughters, both homes and abroad, come together to celebrate what is usually termed the starting point of a new year for Ikari land. The festival also features masquerade parade such as Oke, Seiru, Gaga, among others. There is also the Arigiya festival, which virgin will paint themselves with Osu, Kamwood, and they will be in their nature attire. Islamic festivals such as Ide Molud, Ide Fetri, Ide Karbara, as well as Christian festivals such as Christmas, Easter, and also the New Year festival every January 1st are celebrated with fun fair in Ikare. All these points to the fact that Ikare is such a secular city. was a very astute and successful merchant, a farmer stroke merchant. In fact, he was well known all over the place. He traveled, can you imagine in the 40s, somebody traveling 
from Ikare Akoko to as far away as Onicha for business. And that explains why my eldest brother, brother Daddy Tio Rotawa, went to school in Onisha. He actually went to African College Onisha uh, until our father died in 1950. My mother, uh, who passed on some 10 years ago, was also a very, very successful trader to the last day when he took his last breath. He was a successful cocoa farmer, a cocoa a trader. Mama would calculate every penny, however much it may be. He doesn't have, he does not write. She does not, he's not, he's not educated, but she is literate in her mind. Her mathematical knowledge is beyond uh, comprehension. In fact, I think that most of us who uh, uh, who knew some bit of mathematics took after her. I'm not being immodest. I think I had an A1 in mathematics in my secondary school days, and that I think is something I got from my mother. So also were all other brothers and sisters of mine. I, I was born with a natural birth name, being Ojo. That is a male child with the cord round the neck. I was born in the year 1947. And I was the seventh of eight children of my mother and the tenth of 11 children of my father. Oriki Ojo. Ojo alaka takiti. Ojo abe di yes abalori e yin. Ojo o si inle ome di yedagba. Bojo ba wanle ati kpa ya ome di yeje. Ojo ya loja o dele konyon. Ara le o mo po jo ti ja loja. Be lara o ja o mo po jo ti dele konyon. Mi bite le di yeti in sunkun. To ti inke bo si. Ojo un lota. Ojo on sebe, ojo ala keta kiti, ojo abe di yes aba lori e yin, ojo o sin le ome di ye dagba, bo jo ba wan le ati kwa ye e je. E ni kperi ojo, un lo kperi ojo, e ni kperi ojo, un lo kperi ojo, ojo on we lo do, bo gbo mongge in yo wo o she, wong pe te mini o gba, ojo, te mini o mu, e ni ojo ba gba ti en lo shori ire, to ri kwe la ikwe la i jino. Awa di kulumbu o ye ye o ye ye kulumbu. Omo mbo le de. Ojo, omo wami wale. Ojo, ola wami wale. Ojo, afolabi. Ojo, ola tomi wale. Ojo, ayo wami wale. Ojo, ola dotun. Ojo, ala katakiti. Ojo, ala gbada omi. Ojo, oja lo ja, odele konyon. Ara le omo po juti ja lo ja. Be lara oja omo po ojo ti dele konyon. Ojo je omo ti won ba bi ni le yoruba. To je wikwe. I wwa ti won. Un to jade la okun to. Ta la ti bi i dodo won. To nkwe ni wwa. Ki. Ki un wwa gege bi ta omo to ku. Bi o de she in be en ron koron. To nbe bo la to ko. Be lo jo chon nbe i wwa ti e bo. La ti on. O di on wwa ye. O bi ni wwa wwa nkwe ni a ino. O koni wwa wwa nkwe ni ojo. Dr. Otto wa o Jonathan Eli O ko lu fun mi kale o ne o gba ne Ohun o mo ma mu lu mi pe o ma la koko ni le obi o O ma ko wo sa na tara le o ne o gba ne a ma le che la we O ngo o mo mo lo me pe o O ngo o mo mo lo me pe o O lo 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 ma O lo 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 ma O ngo o mo mo lo lo me pe Growing up, I was brought up by my eldest brother who I regarded as my father until later in my primary school days. 
realizing that in fact he was my brother because I hardly knew my dad as he died when I was barely age three. The most influential person in my life was my late eldest brother, Brother Tio Afolabi Rotowa, who brought me up as a father figure. He taught me how to do the things I do today, which I take for granted, like doing things on time, waking up in time, because I had to do the house course. Because in the family, there was only one female child, and the rest of us boys have to do house chores. And my brother was very, very insistent and on, on us doing our duty as demanded by the upkeep of the house. As a young boy, pre-teenage and teenage years, at home, we had to make sure that the front of the house is cleared, you know, we have to cut the grass, you know, in the, in the, in the compound, we had to clear the, the, the footpath to the farmland, we had to clear the footpath to where water is drawn from the brook before the advent of pipe bone water, and we also, you will have to be surprised about this, um, hawk things like kerosene, um, oranges, you know, and they go to the farms with our parents and they do all, all, all shows. Um, our friends, you know, sometimes, you know, they come with us, sometimes they don't, but, you know, it is very, very important, you know, and the community spirit, you know, makes them want to actually come. Only the lazy ones, you know, tend to uh, uh, back out of such activities. And today, uh, there is a lot, lot of internet and what have you. In those days, there is nothing like internet. Maybe you have an uh, you know, orange to play around as your football. Those are the kind of things, you know, that uh, we used to do. Of course, the homework, after school homework, this priority before any play that we must accomplish. One thing about myself is that um, for my academic achievements, I have, I have to be modest, but I don't know how I can hide it. Because in my primary school days, I was uh, always taking the first position from primary one to primary six, except on one occasion. And in my secondary school days, I was also quite a bright student. Uh, regards my social life, I think I will consider myself as a kind of possibly shy person. I uh, go out with my colleagues, we do things together, but I was not in the forefront of uh, things. All the same, I think I did enjoy myself as much as possible. We play football, we do all sorts of pranks, and uh, you know, we run after girls, you know, um, like you know boys would do in those days, but there was nothing unusual um, uh, happening that uh, one, can, one can be ashamed of. We were really, really, we had good life. We go around hunting, we kill rats, and the uh, pig snails, as things, these were the things that uh, we did in those days. Because, like I said earlier, there was no computer game, there was no internet, you know. So, we, it was an outdoor life. We were out there. In fact, uh, they used to say to me, Kwe Ajay Guru Dagwa. When I go out, it will be nightfall before I come back in. That was me as a growing up young boy. When I was growing up, actually in the 60s, that was the time of the struggle of most African countries for independence. And the influence it had on me is immeasurable. People like Chief Obafemi Awolowo, Patrice Lumumba, 
Kwame Nkrumah. They were in the news. And I was very, very keen in politics in those days. It is a surprise that I'm not a politician today. In fact, my friends used to call me Natostic. Not only from Nathaniel, but from North Atlantic Treaty Organization, because I was always talking politics in my secondary school days. So the politicians had a great influence on my life. I was always buying the Daily Times of Nigeria and reading political articles in those days. Yes, I was always ho hoping to become a politician, but it did not materialize. But I'm happy where I find myself today. <laughs> My closest friend from primary school up to today is Reverend Amos Boyede Arududu. We were together in the primary school. We went to different secondary schools, but we remained very close friends. In fact, uh, he was very also close to me academically. Uh, beside him, I had people I grew up with. Some of them are no longer with us. Some of them are in very big positions uh, in, in a business today. And in the secondary school, I had my best friend is from the then Bender State, uh, which was part of Midwestern Nigeria. Um, and in the university, of course, you know, with, uh, things moved on. I had a lot of friends. Uh, some of them are professors today. Uh, some of them are uh, chairmen of their own um, hospitals. And uh, many of them are based you know in the uk in america and in nigeria among some of my professional colleagues and friends we have dr alaba omotola a retired surgeon and is presently working in as uh, still doing part-time uh, work in nigeria we have dr adeyemi doro who is a, a colleague in microbiology um, we are together at the University of Ibadan. Uh, we have um, uh, Dr. Uh, Adeju Igwe, Professor Adeju Igwe, who are, who are classmates. We have Professor Shodende, uh, classmates. He's a, um, he's, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's, he's a pediatrician. Uh, there are many of them who, whose names will not readily come to mind. Uh, these, these are my, these are my colleagues and. Uh, you know, we, we, we graduated together, we worked together, and there is each of us in, in uh, different parts. Um, we have Professor, uh, Dr. Dokun Ogumbanjo, who worked in, uh, in uh, Australia and also in, Mali, in uh, Mal Malaysia, uh, is now back home in Nigeria. So I have quite a, a good number of uh, friends, you know, uh, also in other professions. But, um, you know, at this point in time, you know, I don't think we have enough time to go into the details of, of these individuals. Life was not, um, we, did, we did not lie on a bed of roses, but, you know, life wasn't the most difficult. We had to do our chores. I was the almost the youngest in the family, so I had I had to help my mother do a lot of things. I went to the farm almost every day 
of my holidays, I was not exempted because my elder brothers also went to the farm. So we had to go to the farm to help out. Okay. When we are on holidays, yes. When we are not on holidays, we are left to do our school work without any 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 hindrance. So uh, we didn't have a lot of money. We did not we did not suffer. We didn't go hungry, but we did not have money to throw around. So we did not have more than maybe two pairs of shoes at best. You know, a few trousers, a few boobas and shirts. But yes, we did not have, have things to waste. Life was not too difficult, but at the same time, it was not, you know, a wasteful life. We did not have things to throw away. The word family is kind of a bedrock. That is where your life starts and quote unquote ends. Everything you do, you must have your family as, as a focus. Do you want to make them happy? Do you want to make them sad? Do you want to uh, uh, disgrace your family? Do you want to make them proud of you so what you do at home at work in the society in the public uh in fact what you put when you put pen to paper and everything you do family comes first and this spirit was imbibed in me by my brothers and by my mother and in fact today the wife i, I have and the children i have know that family is first family if you build a good family you are building the society because the family is the society i see myself as a family man this has been imbibed in me from my childhood I never saw my brothers have unnecessary quarrels with their wives. And when I was married, when I became married, my wife and myself always limit our disagreements to ourselves. Never had I reported or discussed any issues between me and my wife with my brother. I will instead discuss it with my mother-in-law and the same my wife does. I was not ever caned, that's the word they use, caned by my brother. Because a look in the eye is enough to tell you you are going the wrong way. And my children had never been uh, been corporally punished by me. I will speak to them, and that is all there is to it. Today, they can bear me out. Uh, my children, I used to tell them one thing. If you don't use your head, you will use your legs. So they know that they have to think before they act. Otherwise, you know, it may take them a much, much longer time to achieve what they need to achieve. So I always say, use your head if you don't want to use your legs. So that is it. I see myself as a family man to the core. And anything I do is my family first. I, my wife will go hungry. I know I shouldn't be talking about my wife, but she will go hungry rather than, you know, her children going hungry. My mother... Also, I know in those days that she will she 
she will give us everything before she has her own beat. That attribute, I think I gathered from them. And in fact, my life today is, uh, is, is a reflection of what, you know, um, uh, my parents have imbibed in me and what I am able to imbibe in my own children. There were many challenges along the line. Uh, firstly, I remember when I was in primary six uh, in the north, uh, class six, because I was from the west, the, 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 my class teacher did not want to sign my application form for secondary school examination. So I had to leave, uh, but I was lucky. I, I left and eventually I passed. I did not give up. Hopefully, uh, I mean, through the help of my brothers, I didn't give up and I was able to um, to pass an examination to the secondary school. I had grown up also after my school certificate examination, I wish I did very well on. There was not enough money for me to progress immediately. I had to take up job. And in my job, I found that I had to serve a former classmate of mine, which I thought was an indication that I wasn't making enough progress in life. And this actually urged me on to enroll for the sixth form, which luckily I was able to pass. Further on in life, further on in life, I remember having been a lecturer, senior lecturer in Nigeria, having passed my examinations and working, and uh, went to America. I wanted to um, do the uh, examination of the board certification in America, but I was told I have to start from the very, very beginning. And this, I thought, was too much for me to start on. I took that as a challenge that I must find a way out. And that was why I moved from America to the United Kingdom. And within one year, I studied seriously, worked very hard for actually without pay for one year. And I was able to pass my examination. That was one of the greatest challenges of my life, having to pass the examination, not because of academic incompetence, but because of the financial uh, 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 um, issues associated. I was already a family man, uh, not any much, but again, I was able to overcome that. And lastly, leaving my family behind here in the UK and going to Saudi Arabia when my children were growing up and they needed me most was also a challenge that I had to think seriously about. But with the help of my wife, I think I was able to successfully overcome that. And uh, yes, I owe her a lot of gratitude for helping me to overcome that challenge. Once, one thing I know is that when you have your focus, if you are focused, you can achieve anything. And if you have the support of your family, you can also achieve a lot. There are two jobs I think I could do. One successfully, the other one maybe not so successfully. When I was growing up, I thought that I could be a reverend gentleman. The reason being that my parents, my brother was a very, very well-known church-going man, and in fact, um, was the first treasurer of uh, our church. And there was no way you could go away from reading your Bible every day. Maybe the second job I could have done was to be a teacher, and I would have been a very bad teacher because I had no patience for people who cannot grasp what you are telling them. So maybe I would have been a bad teacher. So those are the two jobs 
that I thought I could have been able to do. One a good one, one a not so good one. Um, if I had known that my life would end up in the UK, maybe I would have been here much earlier, maybe 10 years earlier than I did come. Um, I had my first experience of the UK in 1980, and uh, one could have taken a job here, but for love of Nigeria, one has to go back. Eventually, you know, I came back here 10 years later. Um, all the same, they say life goes on while you are making your plans. Your plans may not always work, but your life must go on. So you have to make the best of life. So if I had known that I was going to be here, I would have been here earlier. But all the same, here I am. Thanks to God. For me, the way to live is to live in moderation. Everything you do, you do it in moderation. Make sure you obey the rules. Make sure you do your work. Enjoy your life. If you drink alcohol, drink in moderation. If you do exercise, do it in moderation. Whatever you do, do it in moderation. If you want, if you even scold your children, don't overdo it. It may be counterproductive. Make plans. Live your life. Everything in moderation. That is the way I see. But the only thing you may not do in moderation is your work. You have to work hard so that you can do the other things appropriately. Thank you. The word good life is an everyday thing. When you wake up in the morning, do you have a smile on your face? When you go to bed at night, do you have a smile on your face? Have you had a good day? Is every day a good day? That is not possible. But on the average, has it been a good day? If you can answer yes, I think you have had a good life. Successful life, how do you define it? Are you defining success in terms of how much money you have, in terms of your professional achievement? Those things are very, very individualistic. For me, my success is holistic. I look at my work, I look at my family, I look at everything together. In fact, it's, diff it's sometimes difficult to, to delineate good life and successful life. But we tend to think of success as financial professional. And good life has been happy. You are happy. Happiness is good life. Maybe material is success. That's the way I like to see it. So for the successful life that we're talking about, one has to look at where are the children today. Has one been uh, successful in bringing them up to standard? Yes. Uh, I, I was brought up successfully and I think I have done my bit to bring up my children to where they are. They are doing very well and also my extended family, they appreciate what I've been able to do for them and what they are also been for me. Uh, that is a bit of a success that I've been able to achieve. And all these things help me to feel good in myself, contributing to the good life that I think I am enjoying today. It is not enough for me to say I got a big car, I got a big house, but the happiness which I enjoy, you know, is part of what makes my life a successful life. My children 
What do I think they can remember me for? Of course, I think they find me very easy to talk to. I will listen to them, although I may not necessarily agree with them. And they remember that daddy loves a pint of lager. He doesn't drink too, mel too much, but at least he loves his lager. And um, I am approachable. Like I said, they can talk to me. And also, um, I think they know that I love them and that I will always put them first in anything they do. I hope the young ones will actually listen because they might think this old man is talking. Life is not easy. Achievements always come with, with hard work. They say, may your road be rough. It means that if you achieve success through hard work, you will appreciate that success. There is no fast track to anything. A house built on sand will collapse. A house built on rock will stand. Hard work, hard work, hard work. If you work hard, you will appreciate it. Ishe logun ishe, murasi ishe, oremi ishe ni soni di giga. It is good to work hard because as a matter of fact, people who win lottery, they don't, not all of them make the best of it. If you win your, if you work and make your money, you will appreciate it and you will not squander it. For me, I am where I am today because of hard work. There is some bit of luck, but hard work before luck. That's what I will, and I will employ and implore all my young ones of today to please do a bit of hard work. Thank you. Actually, I thought this was going to be one of the first questions you ask. The most memorable day of my life was the day I set eyes on this young girl. I was a young man too, but this was this young girl. I couldn't keep my eyes off her. And thank God that yes, I did not. Today, she's the rock of all ages. She's the beginning, she's the end. She's not God, she's, but she's the beginning, she's the end. Because everything that all sources I ascribe to her, although she may not agree, I know that I ascribe all success to her because her advice is immeasurable. Like Chief of Afe Maula was said, she is my jewel of inestimable value. And I thank God that I have her as my wife and the mother of my children. And also before I go, I must also appreciate my mother-in-law who cannot be here today but she is a mother-in-law in a million. My wife, she's a wife beside no other wife. My name is uh, Olufunke Murolayo Rotowa Ni Akiyeli Ebeni Yawu Adi. I'm Adi Rotowa's wife. We met when I was, uh, I've just uh, started my nursing in 1974 and I was working in a hospital in a battle called the Ring Road Hospital. Uh, I was on my lunch break and then these guys, I was on my own, about 
15 guys just entered the room. I froze. And then he then realized that I was panicking like mad. Then he then tried to break eyes and say hello. Um, and I said hello. Then he said, um, you didn't even invite us to go and have a bit of this banana you're having. And I call it the banana story. So I said, um, well, you can have some. He said, no thanks. And then they all left the room and I breathed a sigh of relief. That was the first day I set my eyes on him. Um, I've just started my nursing and he was in his maybe fourth year medical school. So we didn't see again until um, <clears throat> I was doing my nursing, until he finished and was doing his housemanship in Adelaide State Hospital. Then we met again and the rest is history. <laughs> All my reactions go away. I've only just started my nursing. I want my education. You need any finishing, so go. I don't want to see you. And that was my reaction, but deep down, I thought, oh, he's handsome. Oh, I like him. Oh, he's nice. Oh, he is really gentle. He's kind. He's loving. Oh, I like him. He could be loving. He could be a potential husband. But I wouldn't tell him. I didn't. I just told him, go away. Hey, well, don't come to me. You know, you've got to play hard, you know. And hard I did play. I did. So good things don't come easy. I'm not blowing my trumpet. But I've got to make sure that this guy will not just love me, will be able to actually help me care for my children, look after my children. And for any woman, that is up, uppermost. So I started judging him then, with the way he behaved to me, with, you know, and his education was a big part. He's well educated, he's a seasoned doctor. So I thought that money-wise, we will be able to live, not an extravagant life, but we will be able to give our, our children if not better education that our parents gave us, but as good as education that we've got. Then I look for other things. But that's the story. I'm Dr. Adele Olu, Atorala, Bamidele, Ifeolu, Botoa. What's sad for me to say about a man who I've known for 38 years of my life, my whole life, the man who brought me here, along with mom, the man who's raised me, who's taught me lessons in how to be a man, who's taught me how to be patient, how to work hard. A man who surprisingly knows a remarkable amount of stuff. A man from whom I learn an, infin an, an, infinite, an infinite amount from every single day. What can you say? 70 years old, having imparted wisdom on all of us, and sometimes imparting wisdom on us without, even, without us even realizing it. Someone who's gregarious, whose quiet smile <laughs> speaks volumes, who can make you laugh at the most difficult of times, who can find the words to make everything seem okay, who inspires you at every turn. You know, I think about where I am today and who I am, what I do, and I became a doctor because of you. The things that I achieve as a doctor, I always think to myself, is this where dad would be? Is this what dad would be doing? How would dad approach this problem? In fact, it's not just that as a doctor, it's, it's in all aspects of life. You know, I know that when my biggest fear is when I have a family not knowing what to do. And I remember speaking to you about it and dad saying to me, just do your best. That's all I can ask of you, you know? Just do your best. I know. I remember the first drink I ever drank. Not the first sort of drink, but the first alcoholic drink I ever drank. And it was a pint of Guinness. 
you know, what 19 year old man drinks Guinness? <laughs> I was like, why am I drinking Guinness? Then I remembered why. One of my earliest memories of you was in Nigeria. I think I was seven years old. And I saw you drinking a pint of Guinness. And I wondered, what is that weird black drink that dad's drinking? I want to drink that when I grow up. I want to be cool like he is. <laughs> it's just the funny ways in which you inspire. You know, when I was in university, I took a photography. And it's because I, I found your old camera and I kept it. And they inspired me to, to take a photography. You know, I think back, I have, I have probably more winter coats than any man should have. Why? Again, because when I was 18, I found a winter coat that you bought 18 years ago on your first visit to Manchester. You know, it's things like that. There are times that, you know, there are things that you wish I did and I don't do. But, uh, you know, just, yeah. <sighs> Struggling to find the words. 70 years old. And, you know, you've got a lot of years in you left. You've got a lot of time to, to explore and to travel and to do things. And the one thing I wish you'd stop doing is I wish you'd stop working. But, you know, I think you need to keep working because that's who you are. I think it's what makes you you. I think you, if you didn't get up in the, if you got up in the morning, you didn't feel that, that if you lack that sense of purpose, then you wouldn't be you, you know? And as you know, whenever you watch this, <laughs> I know you'll be sat there thinking, I've still got a few more lessons to teach you, boy. <laughs> I agree, you must definitely do. But yeah, words will never express the gratitude that me, Tito, Mom, and Taya have to you for just being there, for just doing all the things that we don't even know that you do in all the ways that we don't even understand or appreciate that you do it. I can't say thank you enough. Thank you, Dad. Uh, my name is Tomilewa Omolola Rotowa, better known as Tito Wawa by my dad. Um, I'm dad's daughter, his only daughter. <laughs> That's brilliant, really. He's, he's very calm. He's a calming influence in this family. Um, he, Dad's got this smile. He's just got this this big smile that just always lets you know that everything's okay and everything's going to be fine. Um, he's very much, I don't know, I guess a, a centerpiece to this family. He's great. I've got two girls, and he's just the best granddad that you could imagine. Uh, one of my favourite memories. I've got a few favourite memories of Dad. Um, you know, always seeing Dad coming to the airport to pick us up when we used to go and visit him in Saudi Arabia, and then getting to spend the summer with Dad. You know, just doing all the silly things that you get to do. Um, and I remember on my wedding day. Uh, so I got married to my husband Nick in 2004, and. Uh, you know, I rode in the car with Dad to the church and we just had one of those perfect conversations. Um, one of those that I remember for my whole life. I'm not going to tell everyone what it was because it was private, but it was just one of those perfect moments. And then I remember getting to the church in my full wedding regalia, so my dress, and I remember Dad showing me up with his amazing shoes. <laughs> now, if you know me, you know that I love shoes, but nothing, not even me in my wedding dress, could, pe could compete with my dad and his mock crocodile amazing shoes. And it was all everyone would talk about. And that's just, you know, and it was just, it was a perfect day with a, a perfect memory. Um, and I don't know, he's my dad, and he's just, for me, he's perfect. How can I describe him? Um, calm, chilled. Uh, a really good sense of humour, um, uh, a huge, huge smile, and quite an infectious laugh. And um, to um, to Everly and Lyra, who are uh, my daughters and his granddaughter, he's just he's lots of fun. Um, he does all the silly things that you would expect uh, a grandfather to do. And you know, for us, he's just um, he's just the centre of our world, really. So yeah. I am Tayo Topiratoa. I am the son of Nathaniel Aderatoa and I, well it is his 70th birthday and I think that I am one of the luckiest people in the world to have him for a father. 
you know, I couldn't ask for I couldn't ask for anyone better. I wouldn't want to ask for anyone better. For the last 32 years, he has done nothing but support me. You know, he's one of the most generous people that I've known. It's a case of he doesn't always give me the things I want, but I'll always get the things I need, and that's that's what's important. Now, all I can say is that if I grow up to be half of the man that my father is, then I know that I'll be fine. If I grow up to be half of the man he is, then I'll have no worries in my life. When, when I was growing up, life with my father, it was, it was good, but at the same time, he wasn't always there. And I don't mean that in a bad way, it's simply because he spent 10 years in Saudi Arabia, you know, sacrificing time with his family to make sure that we had the best that he could, make sure we had the best that he could give us. So the times that we did see him, it was, it was fantastic. But like I say, there were times where, where he wouldn't be around, but that was for very, very good reasons. I mean, <laughs> to describe my dad, generous, not overly generous, but generous. Like I said, he'll give you the things you need, but he won't always give you the things that you simply want. Uh, he's got a good sense of humour, you can take, you can take a joke, you know. I, I enjoy making fun of him. You know, and plus you've seen him, it's not, it's not too hard to make fun of him. And when it comes down to it though, he's nice, he's easy going, he's down to earth. I mean, he can, he knows, he knows when he needs to shout. Put it that way, he knows when, you know, he knows when he needs to be firm, but he also knows when to relax as well. What I want you to learn about, about dad is just that, it's just, well, he's a good man. That's when it comes down to it, that's what it is, he is a good man. You know, I couldn't, like I said earlier, I couldn't ask for a better father. Um, I couldn't even ask for a better friend. You know, he gives me everything I need. If I, have, if I need to talk to someone, I know I can always talk to him. He's always around when I need him. So, you know, like I say, I couldn't ask for anyone better. Dad, you're turning 70. I mean, seriously, you're getting old. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, 70. I mean... Like if, if it was up to me, you know, you'd have another 70 years, but that's up to, that's, that's not my choice, that's the man upstairs, <laughs> but happy birthday anyway, I love you, you know I love you, I've loved you for the last 32 years, and you know, I'll continue to love you for many, many more as well. I love you, but you knew that. And the biggest, grandest, happiest 70th. You only, you only turned 70 once, so... You better be up later than I am. <laughs> Happy birthday, Dad. He deserves everything that's ever come to him and more. Um, you know, our parents, Mum and Dad, have done everything, everything for us. Um, they've taken huge chances. They've always worked hard. I mean, I get my worth ethic. I get my values from my parents. And just... Um, that on his 70th birthday, he's the best dad I could ever have hoped for and a wonderful role, role model. So thank you. All the, best part, all the best parts of me are undoubtedly from my parents. I love you, Daddy. Uh, have a fantastic day, Dad. Have a fantastic day and enjoy everything that life's brought to you because you deserve it. Daddy, I love you. You know that yourself. I will always love you. I will always love you till I take my last breath. And I do say to you, don't go before me. We go together. We will be nothing without you. Thank, thank you very much for coming into my life. Thank, thank you. you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. You know that. Now, as I did do from the first day that I set my eyes on you, you have been a wife, a mother, a sister, a partner, a friend. I don't really know how to describe you. You are so considerate. You put me first, you put me second, you put me last. I am all that is all consuming in your life. And you are all consuming in my life. I thank you especially for the years I was away in Saudi Arabia. You did everything to bring up our children. We thank God for, for you. 
I thank God for you. I thank God for what you are. Thank, thank you, Kenke. I really, I really love, love you. you. I, I love, love you today. today. I will, I will love, love you tomorrow, tomorrow until the last, last days of, of my life. life. Thank, thank you.